Again, there have been probably 150 questions or more. Can't answer them all. Probably will take a couple of months. And I'm sure you wouldn't like to sit here for another month. So we'll... I wonder, one wonders, if there is a final question at all, one question that will answer all questions. We haven't thought about it. We just thought about it just now. Is there a question or an inquiry not an experience, because experiences are always limited, and experiences are conditioned by one's own desires, intentions, and limitations. So one cannot possibly rely on, quest on experiences. They are the most doubtful things in the world. Even this so-called spiritual experiences. I'm sure most of you want that kind of experience that will sustain one, give one energy and so on. But <clears throat> Every experience, however deep, however wide or intricate, such experiences are limited because there is always an experiencer who is experiencing. Right? And the experiencer is the past, past memories, past his background. And according to that background, the experiencer recognizes the experience and lives with it, hoping he'll have greater experience. But the greater experience, or the wider, deeper, is still always limited, because there is the experience of. Now, the question arises, which I'm putting to you, whether there is anything to experience at all. Except biological, sexual experiences and so on, Apart from those physical ex reactions and so on, is there any experience at all? Why do we want experiences? Please, as we said, we are inquiring into this together, not the speaker is saying something and you either reject or accept or pass it by. But if you could examine this very interesting question, is there, apart from the ordinary biological experiences and so on, is there any necessity of experience at all? Experiences apparently keep one awake. Experience or problems are something thrown at you, especially the meaning of that word, problem. 
is something projected at you. That is a problem. The meaning, the root meaning of that word. And experience also means to go through, not hold on what you have gone through. So, does the brain need problems to keep it awake, challenges, crises, shocks? Does it need these things to keep it awake? Because we are we live such a superficial lives, and we are satisfied by it, most of us at least. And by all the education and so on, we become rather mechanical and lazy, indolent. And to keep us awake, we feel problems, pressures, and so on, need to keep the brain alert. Right? Can the brain be alert, extremely watchful, without any drugs, problems, challenges, shocks. Have, have we ever inquired into this at all? Or we are so eager to have something more, something better, measuring always, which makes the mind still more dull. It's a dull mind asking for more. Right? But we're not being cynical, please. But if we could inquire into something and find out whether the brain, which has been conditioned for millennia upon millennia, conditioned through various accidents, incidents, pressures, propaganda, programmed, can that brain be naturally, without any effort, be fully awake? To find that out, one must reject totally all experiences. except the experiences, physical experience, psychological experiences, must be totally rejected, and so not depend. Not depend on pressures, impressions, stimulations. You are being now, by the speaker, being stimulated. Unfortunately, he will act as a drug, like coffee, tea, or stronger drugs, alcohol, and so on. If one depends on these things as a stimulant to keep the brain alert, then you are merely 
sustaining the mechanical process. And the brain has become, for most of us, mechanical, repetitive. So, to live a life without a single challenge, which doesn't mean it goes to sleep, without a single demand, both outwardly or inwardly, so the brain is extraordinarily active. Action is not movement. I wonder for May I go into a little bit? Interest you there? Action is not movement. Movement implies time. Right? To go from here, there, and so on. Any kind of movement is in the realm of time and thought. Right? All movement, both physical and psychological or thought, is contained in the field of time. Right? And action is not of time. Action is not having done, and the remembrance of the things that have been done, or experience, or problems solved, which is all the background, which is time, or the future is also time. Therefore, action is instant, the very living of it immediately, instantly. Are we conveying something of this? So we are talking over together the question of a brain that has been so spoiled. So shocked. So wounded. Any shock is a wound. And or any hurt. To have such a brain that which is not capable of being hurt psychologically. You may receive a shock when you fall down the staircase. That's a different matter. I hope you won't fall down the staircase. But the shock that one receives or bad news, or you suddenly the doctor says, old chap, you've got cancer. Or the shock of someone leaving you. All those kind of shocks wounding naturally the brain with so that you are constantly in a strain. But to have a mind which is, which, is, which is untouchable by circumstances, you understand? To have such a brain is something extraordinary. That's part of meditation. Not all the silly stuff that's going on. So we are asked, is there a question which will answer all questions, only one question? We've answered it. 
Đây. Your statement that the tower is that is merely the product of thought and therefore not creation has troubled many artists, poets, musicians who are here and who think that they are creators. Cannot creation include the activity of thought? Your statement that that is merely no, there's something missing here. Your statement that all all art wait me this wrong here. Your statement is merely the product that no, this is all wrong. <laughs> ah yes. Your statement that is merely come on. Oh. Your statement that art is merely a product of thought. Your statement that art is Ah your statement that art is merely the product of thought and therefore not creation has troubled many artists, poets, musicians, including us who are here <laughs> and who think that they are creators. Cannot creation include the activity of thought? Right? Question clear. The speaker has said that thought, with all the nature of thought, can never be creative. So, and thought as an as, which is the expression also of an artist, poet, musicians, and all of us included. Thought is always limited. Right? So first we must inquire into what is thought, why it is limited, whether it's expressed by the greatest poet in the world, or the greatest artist, or the b artist we just beginning. I hope the artist is always beginning, not achieving. I think it was Goya, or Velasquez, I've forgotten who, one of those, said, I'm always learning. Goya? Bene. <laughs> he was 92 when he said that. I'm still learning. So, we have to inquire into several things. First of all, what is creation? Creation, how the world has come into being, is part of creation. And we ought also inquire into thought and the art of living, which is the far the greatest art the supreme art. 
and the art of painting, the art of music, the art of speech. And why do we give such extraordinary importance to artists? The other day, a picture was sold for ten million dollars. It's probably a very good investment. So we have to inquire into all this, not just condemn or say, why do you say that? So first let's inquire, what is the art of living? Why do you say that is the greatest art, greater than any other art in the world? from the marvellous carpenter who puts a cabinet together, and the great artists, Leonardo da Vinci and so on, great classical artists, and the great poets. And those of us who are not our so-called artists, but we may have the sensitivity to look at the mountains, sensitivity to someone's suffering, sensitivity to, the, to nature, to look at a tree. There's a marvellous tree on the road, single, whole, one great trunk with many, many branches full of foliage, fluttering in the wind. When you look at that beauty, or the beauty of a cloud with sunlight on it, So we have to also inquire, then, what is beauty? Right? So this question implies great many things, not just one thing. What is beauty? Apart from the physical form, clean-cut face, healthy, full of sparkling eyes and smile and sense of dignity. There is the beauty of a mountain, of a tree, or the running waters. When does one see such great beauty? You may go to all the museums of the world, and the speaker has visited many, many, many museums, and everybody says, oh, what a marvellous picture that is, how beautifully proportionate, the colours, the shape, the grouping, and all the rest of it. So we use the word beauty in so many ways. Beauty salon. <laughs> and so on. What is if you really inquire into it, what is beauty? Is, does beauty lie in the eye, in the heart, or in the mind? Or there is beauty when the self, the ego, is not? You understand? 
The ego with all its problems, with all its travail, with all its confusion, uncertainty, misery, happiness, you know, that is the Self. And when that Self says, how beautiful it is, it has very little meaning. I, there was a... Perhaps you have heard of the Grand Canyon in Arizona, the most extraordinary canyon it is, miles of it, a river cutting through it. It's really the most extraordinary sight. And somebody has said in the book, in the hotel book, I've seen this glorious sight and I'm glad I'm going to have tea. So, is it possible to look at something, the tree, mountain, the valley, your wife or your husband, or something without the self, without you coming between that and your perception. You understand? Is it possible to have, to appreciate that sense of great beauty? And that beauty cannot possibly exist when the Self is, is there. You may be a great artist, the modern sense of that word too, and be tremendously egocentric, tremendously ambitious, grabbing money, right, and paint the extraordinary picture. And we call that a great artist. So we have to ask, what is the art of living? Which is the greatest art on earth, because we have never, the great poets, the great sculptors, Michelangelo, all the rest of them, have they understood? I'm not belittling them or being disrespectful to them or to you who are here as artists, poets and musicians. Can one discover first the art of living and then everything you do is art? And what is the art of living? I believe the word art means giving the right proportions to life, giving, placing all the things in life in their order. not exaggerating any one thing, and to find out the art of living requires tremendous, not only intellectual capacity, but also great sensitivity. The art of living can only come when, the, when there is total freedom. Freedom from all our petty little worries, 
all our intentions, all our problems, fears, and when there is this extraordinary sense of wholeness, that is, when there is when you are nothing, nothingness is wholeness. I wonder if you understand all this. Because we are always wanting to be something. If you are a clerk, you want to become the manager. Uh, if you are a scientist, you want to explore more and more and more and fame, publish, you know, all the rest of it. Research. Research into biology, not research into your own mind, your own being. That doesn't count in the world. That's no importance. But we, as scientists exploring into the atom, <coughs> given tremendous importance. Right? So can we find out for ourselves the art of living? To go into that, we must find out the nature of thought, Thought is born of knowledge, right? As memory. Thought is memory, knowledge, experience. If there is no experience, no knowledge, no memory, there is no thinking. You may have a feeling, but it is no active thinking. And our thinking, in any direction, horizontal or vertical, linear or whole, is still limited, because knowledge is always limited, whether now or in the future. Is that clear? That is so. It is not what the speaker is saying, asserting. It is a fact. Because all our experiences are limited. You want. When it is limited, there is a demand for the more. More knowledge. And we see that knowledge, though some of the biologists and scientists say through knowledge, man ascends. You must have heard. Man ascends through knowledge, probably physically. You understand? You are building greater houses, better houses, better heating, better roads, better communication, better ways of killing man, and so on, so on, so on. So thought, being limited, has created this world, this society in which we live, obviously. Thought has created all the rituals in all the religious organisations. Thought has created the gods out of our out of fear, out of the desire for comfort, security. Thought is a material process, because, you understand, it is contained in the brain. The brain, the speaker is not an expert on brain, 
but he's watched. How one's own brain works. Its reactions, its, its rhythm, and so on. I won't go into that, all that. So thought, whatever it does, is limited. And being limited, it can invent. Invent new ways of building a cycle, better ways, invent new combustion, internal combustion machinery, and so on. The you know, jet and so on. It can invent everything. But invention is not creation. Right? One may write a beautiful poem and feel that's my that's my creation. But it's still within the area of thought. Right? Bound to me. If I write a, if one writes a poem, how oh, magnificent, how oh, beautiful, how oh, depth in the rhythm of the words and all that. It is still the feeling may be in different, but the expression of it is still within the field of thought. And so whatever thought does is limited, and inventions are limited. Uh, one invents something, and somebody comes along and invents that the same thing much better. And so on, so on, so on. So, what is creation? This has been a question that has been asked by the ancient Hindus, the later Greeks, and we say God has created all this. That's a very convenient way out of things. But with Phanas, for oneself, putting all these assertions aside, what is creation? Can it be born out of knowledge? And therefore, creation is limited, or creation is something beyond all knowledge, which has nothing whatsoever to do with knowledge. You understand? Go in, if we go into this very seriously, to find out. Not I find out, you tell you, but find out for oneself. As it has nothing whatsoever to do with thought, with memory, with knowledge, with experience. So we'll put all that, use one word to convey all that knowledge. As we said, knowledge is always limited, now or in the future. And creation must be something limitless. Not, I create a poem, that's, that's a very misuse of that word, if one may point out. Uh, we are not billeting the artist or the painter or the etc. But 
when we are inquiring very, very deeply into this question, to find out that which is not created by thought, the immensity of the universe. One can look at the universe through a telescope, see the various gases and so on, but the, the enormity of creation, the thing that is not measurable by words, we measure everything by words, to be free of knowledge, you understand? And yet have knowledge in its place. find that out, but that brain can never be free from knowledge and the world, but yet keep knowledge at its place, you understand? Driving, talking, writing a letter, various forms of skills and disciplines. Their knowledge is absolutely necessary, otherwise you and I, the speaker, wouldn't be sitting here. But the sense of immensity, the sense of that creation which is not measurable by thought, and therefore creation is So creation is something that has no relationship with knowledge. I would like to cry out for help, but how can one be helped, in quotes, to freedom. I would like to cry out for help, but how can one be helped, in quotation, to freedom? There are, there are moments and days, periods, when we want to be helped. We want to be helped when you go to a doctor. We want to be helped when we have a disease, when we have been troubled by asking, talking over with somebody. We're always in the world, whether here or in Asia or different parts of the world, we are always wanting to be helped, right? And there are those who give you help, the priests, the vicar in the local village, the pope, those gurus who say, I'll help you. There are the, all those people in the world who are trying to help others, because people are wanting help. This is apparently natural response to all their travail and to their misery and happiness. Probably most of you if I, one may most respectfully point out, you are all, perhaps, wanting to be helped. Perhaps. Some may not. And why do you want to be helped?
Who is to help one? This is really quite a serious problem. We have, help, we have been helped by leaders, courts leaders, helped by priests, by psychologists, by therapeutists, by various literature, right? The craving, the human craving, which is crying to be helped. Why? This has been going on not only during our lifetime, it's been going on from the beginning of man, wanting to be helped. Or want to not only live from another, helped by another, but also pray to God, to some symbol, to something crying out for to be helped. And this we have been doing for thousands and thousands of years. Political leaders, social leaders, and so on. Gurus with their absurdities. All this has been going on. And we have not been helped right? to be helped means to become strong. Not depend on anybody. to see things objectively, very clearly, not personally. And because we are rather indolent, we are so easily satisfied, but most of us are discontent. Discontent, discontentment is like a flame. We want to smother it. We don't keep that flame alive. Because it's too troublesome. It might bring about destruction. Not destruction, revolutionary physical destruction, but the destruction of one's own pettiness, one's own uncertainties, and so on. So we want to be helped. And there are people who are helping us. Therefore, they're keeping us permanently in a state of not being able to help ourselves, right? Is it possible not to look to another? Not to look to books, to nothing? Because what you are, is the result of being helped. If you say to yourself, I'm going to understand myself, I'm going to watch myself, see exactly what I am, not get depressed what, seeing what you are, or elated, but just to observe. And this observation is very simple. 
if you really want. You're not seeking help from anybody. Therefore, you have, you have to rely entirely on yourself, which means tremendous responsibility. And we don't want to be responsible. This is one of the things that is happening in the world. We are becoming less and less responsible. Because we say the politicians will see to it, the economists will see to it. If we are troubled, the psychologists, the, the therapeutists, and the psycho all the rest of it. But to be, to have the ever-flowing, living, the depth and the understanding of this movement called the Self, which can be perceived very clearly in the mirror of relationship, right? You are following? You can see yourself very clearly with your wife and in that relationship. Every reaction, every thought, every feeling, not letting one thought escape, watching. And then you have immense strength then you don't rely on anybody, because you are totally responsible for yourself, for your actions. And that demands a great deal of energy, not wasting energy, chattering, 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 talk. You follow? All that. And very few will do all this, unfortunately, because we are all rather slack. Forgive the speaker for you if he uses the word slack. And so the responsibi responsibility is on others, not on oneself, not for oneself. And if you ask for help, you are making yourself more and more feeble. If you have a headache, as I'm afraid most people have some kind of neuralgia and so on, you take immediately a pill. But it doesn't go, one doesn't go into the why it comes, what is the nature of it, why find out, work for it. You understand? See that it doesn't happen. You may be eating wrongly, doing etc., etc. We never go to the cause of things. Where there is a cause, there is an end to it. You understand? One drinks a tremendous lot. Next morning you have a hangover, headache. And to overcome that headache, you take a pill. And the next evening, carry on. You follow? This is the way we live. Highly sophisticated world we live in. And therefore, to ask for help to make oneself more feeble, more irresponsible, more dependent. Whereas if you are totally responsible for yourself, 
everything that you do or that you have promised to do. Never find an excuse and so on, you understand? So that you are stand on your own feet in dignity and responsibility. How can we educate our children to be intelligent and both free and responsible human beings in today's world? How can we educate our children to be intelligent and both free and responsible human beings in today's world? Do you want to go into all this? Apparently this is a question that is asked by every parent in the world. Children. And how can we help them to be intelligent and free and responsible human beings in today's world? Are the parents intelligent and free? Are the teachers intelligent and free and responsible? Is the society, the educational system, helping them to be free and responsible and intelligent? So we have to inquire, if you will, what is, why are we being educated? In mathematics, in biology, science, chemistry, history, all the things that you, one has to learn. And go through university, co college, university, with a degree and a good job. At least one hopes so. Not in this world where there's immense increase of population, unemployment. So if one had a son or daughter, if the speaker had a son or a daughter, what is going to happen to them? school, where they have to learn how to write and read and mug up all the subjects, which then becomes a tremendous problem, you understand? You must go through mathematics. I, one doesn't like it, but you must, if you want to be a good engineer. And so, that becomes a problem. And the society says, become an engineer, it'll pay you more. You understand? So, we have to find out what do we mean by the word education. And is it merely to learn the technique of living acquiring a skill in a particular discipline you understand to become a doctor you have to work study for 10 or 15 years To become excellent surgeon, you follow, takes time, and so on and on. Is this what we are educating our children for? Though it's necessary, understand? 
And is education also, does it not mean educating the human being, you understand, not acquiring mere technique, a skill, but educating a human being to live with great art. That means not only technological knowledge, right, but also the immense, limitless field of the psyche going beyond it. That is to a holistic education, you understand? So all this implies the educator needs education. The parents need education. It's not just the children. And if the parents love their children, love them, not hold them as toys and you know all that kind of stuff. If really love them, would they say? Would they allow their children to be killed or to kill? You understand, sir? Government demands, perhaps not in America or in England, but in this country, in France and Europe, you have to become. You have to go into the army for two years. How to carry a gun, how to shoot, how to kill another human being. And this, the mothers, the fathers accept this. And they say, we can't do anything. Governments demand this. Please, I'm not, I'm not advocating that you revolt against the government. It's up to you. So, education means a holistic approach to life. Cultivating the brain technologically, you understand? And also cultivating the brain to be free of its own petty little self. That requires teachers who understand this, who are committed, who are responsible. And the parents. They must love their children. Now what happens? They cuddle them, they hold them on their lap, they kiss them till they are two, two, five. After that, they throw them to the wolves. Right? And this is called education. How can they be? Intelligence when your brain is being conditioned. You understand? Conditioned by knowledge on one side, conditioned by your own fears, anxieties, loneliness, despair, all the rest of the ugliness of human beings. And on the top of that, there are the temples, churches, mosques. So the religion is something entirely different, a way which has nothing to do with your life, and committed entirely to earning a livelihood. Yes? This is becoming more and more serious. This dichotomy, this separation. And education is something that must be 
There must be respect, love and affection in all this. So will the parents, the teachers and the students agree to all this? You are responsible for this. You are responsible for your parent, what your children are going to be. One heard a parent saying, must I sacrifice my life, which is drinking, taking drugs, sleeping with women and so on, for my stupid little children? Do you understand what I'm saying? And so the world goes on this way. And it's been going on for millennia. Because we, as parents, as human beings, do not want to live a holistic, a complete life. We are fragmented, therefore, we accept that fragmentation. In that fragmentation, there is no intelligence, there is no compassion. There is no freedom. The last question, what is your relationship to us? <laughs> what is your relationship to us? Will you answer that question? What is your relationship with the speaker? If you are put that question, and I'm putting the speaker is putting you that question, what is your relationship with, with the speaker? Not what's your relationship with me, with you. You understand? The, I'm reversing the question. I'll answer the question after. What my, what's the speaker's relationship with you? It will be answered a little later. But you have to ask first, what's your relationship with the speaker? That means, why are you here? What's your intention? What is it you want? Are you here to be stimulated? To identify with a large group? To find out the truth of what the speaker is saying or just accepting casually for an hour or so and then go on your ways as before? Or you're attracted physically to the speaker? And the speaker has been saying, this is not a personality cult at all. The person doesn't matter. What matters is what he, he say, doubt, question, ask. So what is your relationship with the speaker? To put the question differently, what is the relationship between light 
and darkness. What is the relationship between conflict and no conflict? What is the relationship between peace and war? You understand this question? That means what is the relationship between the good and the bad? Is the good the outcome of the bad? Please, see, that we are working together, not. Is the good outcome of the bad? Or is the good totally divorced from the bad? If the bad is related to the good, to the good, then it's not good. Right? If it's related, if good has its roots in the bad, then it's partially good. Therefore, it's not good. Right? So, one has to discover for oneself the good is totally free from the bad, totally divorced, nothing to do with each other. Violence and to be free of violence. Human beings are violent, unfortunately. One can biologically trace it to the origin of violence, They're derived from the animals and so on, and we won't go into all that. There is human beings are violent, and they have thought out not to be violent, right? So they are violent, and they have created the opposite, which they call non-violence. So the non-violence is related to the two violence. Therefore, it's not free from violence. Do you understand? Is this are we working together? So the good is totally unrelated to the bad. Love and hate. If one knows hate, antagonism, like, dislike, jealousy, right? And then says, I love. Right? Then that love is still related to hate. Right? still related to like and dislike and antagonism and all the rest of it. So, I'm sorry, it's raining. So we're asking ourselves, what's our relationship with each other? What's the relationship of a man who is free and a man who lives in a prison? You understand? We live in prison. Not actual prisons of it, with guards and you know all that, but
We have our own prisons. We make our own prison, and we live in there. Right? And someone who is outside there, what is the man who lives in the prison to the man who is outside? You understand my question? Has he any relationship to you, to the man in prison? Or the man in prison, you understand what I mean, what the speaker means by prison? Our fears, our anxieties, our hope, our loneliness, all the things that human beings have. That's our prison. Our gods, our faith, our dogmatic or superficial opinions and so on. That's our prison. And the man is not in that prison. What is the relationship between the man in that prison and the man who is outside the prison? Has the man in the prison any relationship with the man outside it? Naturally not. But the man outside it has a relationship with the man in prison. I repeat. Have you understood? Listen. I am in prison, suppose, and you are outside the prison. I have no relationship to you. I would like to have a relationship, but I'm still encaged. But you have a relationship to me. Right? Because you have your intelligence and all the rest of it. You love, compassion, your intelligence is utterly responsible of that. So you understand, first we create God by four, omnipotent, all merciful, all powerful, all seeing, all blah blah blah. And we say there is that, and I will pray to be part of him. You understand the same? Business. I am in prison, there you are free. And I pray. See the tricks I am playing. I am praying to something I have created. I have put together, not created, sorry, put together by four. The image, the structure, the symbol, the saviour, the guru, the, all the rest of it. You understand? So we always want relationships some, with something totally outside of us, right? Something immense, and the immensity has a relation to to us, but we have no relationship to that. If we recognize that, see the truth of it, then we'll break the prison. Any cost. If we see that, we'll be, our brain becomes subtle, quick. We are really caught in a prison. And a man in prison is suffocating, crying, hoping, re- re- trying to get at that to be free. And he prays to that, being in prison. What value is it? you understand? It's like those people, monks and nuns and the world over, praying for peace. Right? On the other side, the, the world is preparing, gathering armaments. Yes, God. It's such, you understand the absurdity of all this? So, there is a relationship with another only when both of us are free. 
Right? But we are, one is in prison, other is not, then we are in trouble. Then we waste our energy trying to be related to that. Either one is free or one is not. And to recognize the depth of that freedom, the beauty of it, to see the immensity of that freedom, there must be no self, no ego hiding in different spaces, different parts of the recesses of one's brain. We have finished this morning. May we get up to this?